Let me introduce these three ladies. Judith Stauber holds a PhD. Raise your hand, stand up, do something so we know who you are. Um, she holds a PhD in intercultural communication with an emphasis in museum studies. She has over 20 years of community leadership and cultural organization management experience and six years university experience teaching undergraduate and graduate level communication courses. Stauber founded the Los Alamos Japan Project, an innovative intercultural program to create a bridge of understanding between museum communities in Los Alamos, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. Stephanie Yeamans, seated in the center, is the Los Alamos Historical Society Registrar at the Archives. She holds a BA in History from New Mexico State University, so I think she's happy about the win over UNM this weekend, maybe. Her museum work Did includes- something? <laughs> I heard, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, that's, we don't watch our sports. <laughs> uh, her museum work includes collections and sessions, uh, database management, exhibit development, and grant writing. Stephanie is a fourth generation New Mexican and Los Alamos native. She's married with two red-headed boys, and as a consequence, she only has one hobby, and that's history. <laughs> Callie Funk uh, is a senior, uh, senior in high school and a lifelong resident of Los Alamos, New Mexico. She's the daughter of Kathleen and Dave Funk. She is interested in pursuing degrees in psychology and neuroscience after graduation. She's been an, an intern at the Historical Society continuously since June of 2015. She loves car races. She loves working on cars. She loves Japanese cars and owns a 2007 Acura TL S-Type. It has almost 300 horses. At the crank, she says. <laughs> she has two dogs, three fish, and she just adopted two kittens on Friday without her parents' permission. <laughs> so everyone, let's give a big round of applause for Judith, Stephanie, and Kathy. And I, want to, I do want to say that they will, they will be answering questions during the reception. Okay, so we won't answer questions formally during this hour, but all you should, they'll answer all your questions then. Okay, so thank you very much. Here you go. Thank you, Todd. Thank you all for coming. Um, just to clarify, we had an earlier event, um, this culture co-op event, where you can, you can I'll pop passes around, they're all over. Um, we're making origami cranes that we're going to send from our community to the museums in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, we'll start that project tonight and see how many we can amass over the next few months. Um, you'll see in, in photographs that we'll share with you um, over the next hour the way that these origami cranes often appear in those museums, and they're sent from communities all around the world. Um, and so far, there is nothing that has been sent from Los Alamos to these communities, so we will change that. Um, also, when you pick up your um, poster, please note uh, multiple perspectives on the atomic bomb. The entire series for the year was inspired by our trip and the things we learned on this project. Um, three of the, of the lectures, including tonight's, um, will be on subjects related to Japanese life. So I hope you'll pick them up, and we'll tell you a lot more about those. And in the meantime, we'll talk about the project. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll do my best. I'm, I'm a roomer. So um, the main goal, the, the main goal of our project, um, as you can see, and as Todd mentioned, is to build a bridge of understanding between Los Alamos, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. Um, that's no small thing. That's a, a pretty idealistic goal, and we're, we're well on our way. This, this trip was the first part of this initiative, um, but the project itself is a long-term project, um, and the trip is a part of it. So this, I'm giving you some background about the project, um, and then we're going to talk a lot about the trip. Um, but the project is infused with some really essential values that are really important to intercultural learning and the intercultural goals. And the first is partnership. Um, we have people here, um, we have these wonderful women that are making origami cranes, if you met them, Eva and her daughter Leah, thank you for joining us. They're from, um, I, I met them at the Japanese Cultural Festival in Santa Fe, but they're part of a group called Santa Fe Jin. Um, they're connected also to Shoko Cafe, so you should go there and eat sushi in Santa Fe. Um, but please meet them afterwards. Also, we're joined, so you can raise your hands, please, hello, there they are. Um, and another really wonderful organization, where is Victor? Victor Imada, he's here, I know. There he is. He's raising his hand in the back. So Victor's part of an organization called the New Mexico Japanese American Citizens League. The JACL is a national organization, and we have 
um, our chapter of a New Mexico chapter based in Albuquerque, and um, Victor has been a wonderful partner. And we've been partnering with these two groups uh, for a while now. We've co-sponsored programs. We've invited um, different speakers of theirs to come up here. So before I even began this project, and for two years was emailing Hiroshima trying to get them to talk to us, um, we were forming partnerships in New Mexico. Um, if you don't know, we have a sizable um, Japanese American and Japanese population all around the state. And Victor will tell you later about some programs. He's got some information on the table out in the ante room. Um, dialogue is what we do. So sorry if you help, if you really like Q&A. We do, we're very interested in dialogue. That's um, a really important value of this project. So part of the reception is gonna be a way for us to have a conversation together. So if you have questions, we will answer every single one of them to the best of our ability while we're snacking on sushi and some other delights. Um, so this is about shared history, a shared and very complicated history. Um, it began here and ended in Japan in some ways. Our story begins here, or our story ends here where it begins in Japan. Um, and you see that in our museums in a lot of ways. In our new museum, you'll be seeing a bit more Japanese perspectives than our new museum. So when you come in December to our grand opening, you can see what that's like. Intercultural learning is what this is all about also. Um, understanding where we come from, our frame in the United States when we think about atomic culture is often from the sky, from the plane, from the Inolage or another plane. Um, in Japan, they're looking at what happens under the mushroom cloud. And that's a very different perspective and a very different frame of reference. And those stories from the ground are part of the very impactful experience that we had with the people that we met. Um, and it's collaborative. So like I said about this being a very, it's a long-term and in some ways slow-going project. Um, we're building relationships and real relationships and meaningful relationships take time. Um, that collaborative piece means also that I don't necessarily know what this is gonna look like in a couple of years because we're gonna be working together with our colleagues in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and some colleagues we met in Kyoto as well, <coughs> excuse me, to um, determine together what we'll work on. So I have ideas that we'll share with you for symposium and workshops and exhibits and films, but I also don't want to predetermine um, everything that we're gonna be doing. So that's why collaboration is important and it's long-term, which I've said several times. Um, so our, the, the trip that we went on is a part of a threefold um, initiative for this year. So the trip kicked it off. Um, we'll be doing a series of cultural programs, this one included. Um, some of you attended a program where we did a debrief right when we came back, we were still practically jet lag, um, and talked to my own it and shared lots of stories. We're gonna continue to do that. Um, we're gonna be talking to Rotary um, in Los Alamos in February. We are gonna be at conferences. We're gonna be doing a lot of programs throughout the year to share our experiences. And, um, in April, we're gonna launch an exhibit in our new changing exhibit space in the museum, um, in the guest cottage, the building behind here. Our museum campus is expanding, so um, some things will happen in the beta house and some things will happen in the guest cottage. This, and this will be in the changing exhibit space there. So we'll be sharing photographs and stories and putting together an exhibit based on what we've learned about Japanese museums. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are our travel goals. They were pretty straightforward. Um, we wanted to visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki to meet with our counterparts, to, to learn their storytelling perspectives, first of all. I mean, if we understand that um, one story ends where another begins, we didn't know much more than that going in, and we learned a lot about their storytelling perspectives. We met with colleagues, and that's the book that I'll be talking with you about, sharing all the connections that we made with various people, and determining their willingness for collaboration, which the secret's out, we did. So <laughs> we um, are really thrilled to be able to say that after just one trip that we were really welcomed um, in a very friendly way. And to begin to identify areas of common ground. There are, there are areas of common ground, um, if that surprises you. So here we are, we're about to leave. One thing that you should know about Dave Funk is that he could drive really fast to the Denver airport <laughs> at 3.30 in the morning. And uh, we are indebted to him. This is a picture of us in the Denver airport, not well rested. <laughs> to begin our trip, but thank you, Dave. Yeah. So we, uh, we arrived in Tokyo. We spent three nights in Tokyo, um, in part because that's where the airports are, but also because we wanted to experience what a modern city is like in Japan, and we spent a few days there. We also had a very important meeting at the embassy. So we were thrilled to be welcomed into the embassy um, by our colleagues, um, Dale Kreischer on the right and Aki um, Nakamura on the left. 
Um, they spend a good amount of time with us. Um, we shared our ideas with them, and they encouraged us and encouraged us um, and supported our ideas and gave us a little bit of advice, but not too much. We hadn't planned on talking to our Japanese colleagues about um, Japanese nuclear scientist research, but we were told not to, and so we didn't. Um, <laughs> but that wasn't really on our list of things to talk about. Um, they were really impressed. We learned a lot from them, and we have um, we have them as partners um, in the work that we're doing. So they've offered they offered a wonderful suggestion to host um, a workshop in Tokyo, which would be a neutral place where we can invite our colleagues from other cities around Japan to come together. So whether that will happen at the embassy or somewhere where they can connect us to. But um, our favorite thing that came out of it, Aki on the left, um, Japanese born, um, sent us off with this quote that we can now use that it's a challenging, about the project, it's a challenging one, but also a truly epic project for both countries in the often. We were pretty excited to hear that. <clears throat> we shinkansen from city to city. I had to put that in there. So we spent four nights in Kyoto. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the places we went and the people we saw. And these delightful ladies at the table are going to go into great detail about the two museums, about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in case you're wondering. Well, we, we went to Kyoto with a very good reason. Uh, before we left, I had a meeting with Rose Beda in Ithaca, New York, who just turned 99, um, um, wife of Hans Beda. Um, their daughter, Monica, is the woman on the left, actually. Sorry. For photographs, it's going to be a little bit easier. We have some good lighting. So that's Monica on the left. She's lived in Kyoto for 50 years. She spent half a day with us, touring us around Kyoto, and, um, taking us for a traditional Japanese tea ceremony. And we stumbled upon a kimono fashion show in progress at a textile factory. Um, we got a real taste of Kyoto arts and crafts through Monica and also through our own explorations. And she was delightful to spend time with. She told, she told the stories about coming back to Osama. She came back um, almost every year as a kid. She grew up in Ithaca, but she was born here. And she came back every year playing with friends and kids in the canyon. She had great stories and a great love for Los Alamos. Another person we met in Kyoto who you will meet because he is our March lecture is this gentleman on the right. His name is Masaru Tanaka, and he is a wonderful person who had found out that we were going to be there through a colleague of mine um, who teaches at Kendo University in Tokyo. And he's pointing to a brochure that he had when he was here in 2012 at the Art Center, in the Fuller Lodge Art Center. Um, for an August 6th memorial, he was doing a collaborative project with a woman named Betsy Miller Cruz. If you know that name, she's an artist who lives in Hamas Springs. Her dad was a Manhattan Project scientist. And they have had an 18-year collaborative project. He's Hiroshima-born, she's Los Alamos-born, Child of the Manhattan Project. And they, um, they put together collaborative pieces. He's a photographer and she's a painter. And they'll be coming here um, to talk with us. But he's, so he's pointing to a brochure at an event on August 6th that I attended. And he didn't realize that was me that he was coming to see. So he's, I, when he handed me this gift of this brochure and some other books and some videos, we got many, many gifts from speakers and people that we ran into. Um, I, I, he's pointing to a photograph of me that's in his brochure that he gave me as a gift. <laughs> <laughs> and I pointed to it and I said, look who's in the front row. And he looked at me with the hugest eyes. And so he's now a very good friend of ours. <laughs> and he's looking forward to coming here. So I hope he'll come back in March. Um, Kyoto Museum for World Peace was an interesting surprise. So we, we had planned on going. It was on our itinerary. But we didn't realize that. Um, they're quite overt about their core principle, this facing the past honestly and looking at um, not just what World War II did to Japan, but what Japan um, is guilty of doing as well. And they talk about that overtly. Um, that's their mission. That core principle of facing the past honestly is a quote from um, a statement from their museum director. And it's a very different kind of museum. I have, we have no photos to show you because we're not allowed to take pictures there. Um, but we'll, there's, there's, there's more to this story about Kyoto coming in the future. We spent six nights in Hiroshima. That was the longest place that we spent anywhere. Um, we were the advance team for the G7. <laughs> they were there um, just three, four days after we were. And when we got off the train station, at the train, um, these were the banners that we saw. And it was a pretty exciting welcome. We thought there should have been less Alamos banners for us. 
that's okay. So another um, delightful person that we met, um, who was very generous with us, this is uh, a nephew of Ikuku and Davis Begay. Does anyone know Ikuku and Davis Begay? I know some of you know them. Oh good, yeah. So they live in Albuquerque, and um, they're our April speakers. So please, <laughs> get ready for a year of learning about Japan. Um, they're terrific people. Davis Begay is a native New Mexican, um, married a Hiroshima-born woman named Ikuku. They met in Japan, and now they've lived in Albuquerque for 30 years. Their nephew, uh, Kodoro, um, picked us up at our hotel and spent an entire day spoiling us on a day off on a weekend, taking us to Miyajima Island, um, a very famous place with a Tory gate in the water that you might recognize. You'll maybe see a picture of that later. Um, Kodoro um, has spent time in Albuquerque, and our, our fun fact about Kodoro is that he learned to make sushi at Japanese Kitchen in Albuquerque. When he was <laughs> an undergraduate student, he came and spent a year with his aunt and uncle in Japan, in, um, in Albuquerque, and that was his first learning to, to make sushi in New Mexico. <laughs> so this is Kenji Shiga. He is a delightful, delightful person. We arrived at the first of the Peace Memorial Museum not sure how we would be greeted. Uh, quite nervous, in fact. Um, and um, he was extremely friendly, didn't speak a word of English. His English is as great as my Japanese, which is none, um, except for a few words. And, we communicated quite well with him. He, um, he spent two half days with us, cleared his time. He's a very busy person. He spent a lot of time with us, touring us around, talking with us, having a picnic with us, which you'll see in a few more pictures. Um, my most visceral memory of him talking to us is going like this and gesturing that he had the weight of the world on his shoulders collecting, trying to collect stories of survivors before they're all gone. So that was a big flash moment for me of, hey, that's a point of common ground. Um, we're busy collecting oral histories of Manhattan Project scientists, Manhattan Project people, um, cold warriors even, you know, just collecting our stories. So that's a, a, a really huge point of, um, of common ground, not just that pressure, but also that that's our focus. We're both, both of our museums are very interested in first-person narratives and telling history through those personal stories because we know that's what resonates with visitors. Chairperson Komizo um, gave us a special tour. It was a very special treat to meet with him. Um, people who are involved at upper levels of planning the Manhattan Project National Historical Park um, have met him. He's part of, he was at the scholars retreat for that park. Um, his English is very, very good, so we got to talk with him quite a lot, and he led us on a tour. He um, explained vision to us, standing in front of a display of a bomb in the museum. We were blown away how much science we learned in their museums, and how much sense-making Japanese people are um, spending time doing, trying to figure out, at the time, literally what, what fell there, what, what happened to them. So there's a lot of science in the museum, and he, was really able to speak to it. We were quite surprised. Um, the Peace Culture Foundation is the umbrella organization for the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. So he was a very high level dignitary who spent a couple of hours with us and we were quite happy to meet him and learn from him. So we planned our trip for peak cherry blossom season somehow. And uh, we found ourselves in Hiroshima with an opportunity to engage with the staff in a really different way and have a picnic, enjoy Hanami, this experience of sitting under the cherry blossoms and enjoying bento box lunches that they ordered for us. And um, we were able to have a really collegial, very different kind of, we, we could not anticipate this. I mean, this is a pretty amazing picture. Um, this isn't what we thought going in, and it might not be what you thought. When, what, what, what did it look like for us to meet with staff in Hiroshima? This is what it looked like. <laughs> And we had a really delightful visit with them. It also was very interesting to be there during this time um, in a very somber place in a memorial park. We'll hear more about this, um, the kinds of things that are part of the Peace Memorial Park. But when it's covered in cherry blossoms and full bloom, it's not really the most depressing place. <laughs> we were quite privileged to be there um, in two cities for, for peak cherry blossom. So Ken Murata, we, we met some wonderful guys. Um, they have guys who speak all languages. They have programs. Um, and exhibit guides in all different languages, about 15 languages. Um, and Ken was wonderful, and of course, um, it was beautiful weather the entire time except when we went on the tour of the future. So we got to enjoy some rain in Hiroshima. 
Um, a very, very important meeting we have is with Keiko Agora. She spent an hour and a half. She's a survivor of the bomb, um, and she's a pretty happy person considering. I mean, that's a photograph that you might not think of what a survivor might look like either. She, um, for an hour and a half, spoke with us, and it is a testimony, and that's what they're calling um, survivor talks. They're giving testimony. They're speaking their truth, and we're witnessing it, and for an hour and a half, she told us stories. I mean, she's still at, she's 80 um, or so, however-ish. She was eight um, in 1945. Let's, let's put it that way. I'm too mad. She, um, one, of the, one of the most compelling things, she, she told us many, many stories. The, one of the first things she said to us was that she had been to Los Alamos and how beautiful it was. She was very interested in reaching out to us and um, making us feel comfortable, which was pretty interesting. Um, among the many, many painful things that she shared with us was the guilt that she still lives with, um, giving water to dying victims that she thought I want to help them, they're, they're thirsty, they're dying, I want to do the right thing. She watched people die before her that she had given water to at eight years old. And at this age, recalls it like it happened yesterday. One of the things that um, I think I, I hear a lot from Americans are, uh, is this idea that when we go to Japan or when we interact with Japanese, that there's this idea that they expect that um, we're going to apologize or that they want an apology. And that wasn't an experience that we had at all. In fact, um, this was her, what, her, what she said to us. Um, we don't want an apology. The only American I hate is Truman. Even his grandson, <clears throat> even his grandson was welcome when he visited Hiroshima. That's a pretty strong and powerful statement. And it was just a one quote in an hour and a half of um, remarkable stories that we'll share more. Though Jacobs was a big surprise. We had, her, we had um, a few appointments with some faculty at the nearby Hiroshima Peace Institute, um, part of Hiroshima City University. Um, and only one of them ended up being able to come, and we spent some time with Bo, and um, we weren't really sure how academic or how challenging or what the meeting would be like, and it was extremely collegial and friendly. Um, he's Chicago-born, he's been there 10 years. He had a lot of um, interesting anecdotes about teaching um, American students, Japanese students. His wife is the only English-speaking therapist in Hiroshima, so she's quite busy. Um, and he'll be coming here. He was almost here tonight, this close. It was this close. Um, but he will be coming to see us soon. And um, All of these people are part, not just connections that we made, but they're part of what our long-term dialogue will be. So you, you will definitely be hearing from uh, Bo Jacobs, and I expect him to be in Hiroshima soon, or in Los Alamos soon. Um, our final three nights we spent in Nagasaki. This is a beautiful picture Kali took of um, Nagasaki at night. If you haven't been, it is a beautiful mountainous port city. And we spent time with the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum. Um, this is the director, Nak D Director Nakamura. Can you tell which one? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he spent um, all 20 minutes with us. And it was a very intense 20 minutes. Um, the rest of the staff stayed with us the entire day. We had um, a very nice tour and conversations and more collegial time, but it was a good bit stiffer than the time that we had in Hiroshima under the cherry blossoms. So um, we were lulled into a sense of security, I think, in Hiroshima. I'm quite shocked when this came around. But, we, but, it, but it was interesting, and this is more of what we were expecting. So um, what we're all standing in front of, too, is a, it, this is their boardroom filled with um, gifts from communities around the world. And we need to send something, so let us know what we should send. <laughs> we want to send something to have in our boardroom that people see something substantial that says Los Alamos or is from Los Alamos. The rest of the staff, um, the outreach um, person Yayoi is on the left, the, a curator who had just started that week. Hey, wasn't it that week? It was very recent. Um, Minako, who's to my left as you look at the image. <coughs> And the deputy director, um, Hashi, all the way to the right, made a point of telling me that his name Hashi means bridge, which I took as a very good sign. It was one of the first things he said to me when we came in. So it was a mixed and interesting um, set of meetings in Nagasaki, um, but we, um, we remain hopeful. <laughs> so we've uh, had a lot of media attention. Um, 
the shumum is the first one listed. Um, that's the image on the left. There's a tiny little picture here of um, Kelly and Stephanie and I touring the museum with the director. Um, Harisha Matigi just came to Los Alamos recently and interviewed us. Um, Kyoto News followed us all around Japan. Um, they met with us almost everywhere we went, taking pictures of everything we did. And um, NHK World came here and interviewed us also just last, last month. And um, the Santa Fe New Mexican um, interviewed us with a less than stellar article. Coverage nonetheless. So our plans today, um, next month, I hope to be seeing Director Shiga in Chicago. There's going to be an exhibit opening on the Hershwa Peace Memorial Museum and sending a traveling exhibit to Chicago to the Japanese Cultural Center there. Um, that maybe will come to Los Alamos. Um, I want to go check it out and meet with him there. Um, in November, we'll be uh, presenting about our trip and our experiences and our contacts and the whole project at the New Mexico Association of Museums Conference. Um, it's an annual conference this year, it's in Santa Fe, so it's nice and close. And I mentioned the exhibit previously. So these are the plans for this year. When I talk about an expansive long-term project, we're gonna take it one step at a time. So this is what's happening this year. Future plans um, that are kind of, that are already in the works um, to a certain degree. We're gonna plant trees on our museum campus, um, right in front of the building. There we have an opportunity to obtain second generation atomic bomb trees which is very meaningful and important. Um, they would send seeds um, and possibly also cherry blossoms. So, um, and they'll be coming from Japan. Um, I mentioned the workshop at the US Embassy in Tokyo. I'm hoping that will, that's something that could happen 2017, 2018. And um, conferences and exhibits in Los Alamos, we really want to invite our colleagues here um, and also bring together our partners from the New Mexico Japanese American Citizens League, the Jake, and um, Sensei Jin to meet our Japanese colleagues too. And that's my ship. Hi, friends. <laughs> Again, I'm Cowie. I'm a senior in high school, and I've been interning for the Historical Society for over a year now. So in Hiroshima, like Judith said, we spent six nights there, which was a long time, a relatively long time. So we got to learn a lot. Um, OK. So this is a photo in the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. This is a pretty iconic scene here. So um, the park is pretty big. It's got over 50 memorials in it, including sites dedicated to Korean laborers that were there during World War II and American prisoners of war that were killed by the atomic bomb. Um, and the museum is part of the park. It lies within the park's grounds. And it's two buildings, so it's pretty big, a lot bigger than our museum if you've been inside it. <laughs> um, it also includes the Peace Memorial Hall for the atomic bomb victims, which is actually a national memorial, memorial, and it's paid for by the country of Japan, as opposed to the park and museum, which are run and maintained by the city of Hiroshima. And the Peace Memorial Hall also has a counterpart in Nagasaki that is similar. So this picture is some of the more prominent sites in the park. Um, this big saddle-shaped thing is covering a cenotaph, and then kind of inside that you can see the flame of peace, which lies kind of over a pond, and then that building far in the back is the Avon Dome, and these lie in a north to south line with the dome being the southernmost part of it. Um, so the cenotaph is considered to be a shelter for the souls of the victim, and that's why there's this saddle-shaped structure over it. It um, kind of mimics a certain kind of roof that is sometimes used on homes in Japan. And <laughs> so um, under the cenotaph, there's also an archive of the names of all the victims, and get, again, including people of other nationalities and American prisoners of war. Um, 
and it carries the epitaph, it's in Japanese, but it translates, let all the souls here rest in peace, for we shall not repeat the evil. So that's kind of more of an up close view of it. You can't read it, I don't think, unless you know Japanese. <laughs> Um, this is a little better picture of the flame of peace. So it was lit in 1964, and it's a gas flame. And it is supposed to remain lit and burn continuously until all nuclear weapons have been abolished worldwide. So that's always there. Um, here's a better view of the atomic bomb dome. It was previously the Hiroshima Prefectural Industrial Promotion Hall which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it is the closest building to the bomb's hypocenter that is still partially standing. So there's been some controversy surrounding it because a lot of people wanted to keep it and have it stand there and function as a memorial site, while many others didn't want to have to see a reminder of the atomic bomb every day. Um, so that controversy died down somewhat at, over time. But then in 1996, it was actually registered as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And so again, that kind of came back up. Some people didn't want it there, while others did. Um, this kind of scaffolding on the side of it, if you can see that, that's actually, um, it's, it's been worked on to make it, to put in preventative measures for earthquakes. So it's fairly structurally sound, as far as I know. And so this is kind of a close-up of it. And you can kind of see in here these poles are, again, like structural supports. So um, this is the Children's Peace Memorial. So if you read over there with the paper crane making thing um, about Sarako Sasaki, so she was two years old when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and she appeared to be unharmed. Um, but then when she was 12 years old, she fell very ill with leukemia and passed away due to that. And so the children that she went to school with started campaigning to have some kind of marker or monument put in place for her, and that led to this being there. And so all the cranes in those boxes that you can see have been donated and sent from people around the world. So. If you make cranes and you send them, they could go there, potentially. So inside the museum, um, the building, their museum's actually being renovated, which was an interesting point of common ground for us. <laughs> so we talked some about that and the struggles and the fun things that come along with that. So it's two buildings, the main building and the east building, and the east building was closed, so we only got to go through the main building for the most part. Um, it flows sort of chronologically, you could say. So it starts with the effects of the heat from the bomb, and then the blast, and then the fires that it caused, and then the radiation. So when you first walk in, this is kind of what you're looking at as photos of the mushroom cloud, and then it moves into what was going on under the mushroom cloud in Hiroshima. So. This is a child's tricycle on display. Um, the child that owned it was killed by the atomic bomb. And so his father buried him and the tricycle with him as it was one of his prized possessions. But then he later went and unburied the tricycle and brought it back so that it could be donated to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. So that's a pretty famous artifact that's on display there. Um, these are actually stairs from the Hiroshima branch of Japan Bank, which was a building that was very close to the hypocenter. So it's a little tough to see in the picture, but the story is that um, a woman was sitting on these steps waiting for the bank to open because it opened at 8.30 and the bomb was dropped at 8.15. And so she was basically incinerated by the blast that was created this fireball of thousands of degrees. And so the place where she was sitting is less damaged than the place around it. So if you look, this kind of round, gray, black thing is um, a shadow 
you could say, from where she was sitting. And it used to be much darker. It's faded a lot since 1945. Um, the steps were actually kept where the bank was for a long time, and then they were eventually put into a glass case, and then the waiter moved into the museum and put on display. So this was one of a few displays that were in the museum that's a testimony of the fires. So this one particular display has probably 65 or 70 artifacts in it, and there's, I think, two more um, displays like it. So there's pieces of statues, roof tiles, dishes, just parts of buildings and things that were affected by the bomb and its aftermath. So there were a lot of artifacts similar to those on display. And then this is in the kind of radiation part of the museum. So mostly this room that talked about the radiation just had pictures of how radiation affected people and their bodies. Um, and then it also had a few artifacts that had black rain on them, which is dark, sticky, radioactive water that fell after the bombs were dropped. Um, this particular photo is, so Sarako, who I mentioned earlier, um, she, when she fell ill with leukemia, she was hospitalized, and there's an ancient Japanese legend that says if you fold 1,000 paper cranes, um, you will be granted one wish. So she folded 1,000 and made that wish, and she did not seem to get any better, so she actually decided to fold another 1,000. And she ended up folding about 1,500, I think, before she passed away. But these are some of her cranes. They're very, very tiny probably about the size of my thumbnail, and they're on display in the museum. Um, and a lot of other places have her cranes. So the next room, which I don't have a photo of, is about relief efforts in Hiroshima after the bomb was dropped. So that teaches about just people that came or people that sent supplies to help with the relief efforts, and there's photos of that. So. Yeah, that's Hiroshima. Fun things. <coughs> okay, that brings us to Nagasaki, which I will say that I fell in love with Nagasaki. I loved it there. It was a beautiful city. Um, and they had incredible sights. And it was just an amazing place and an amazing experience overall. I'm going to figure out which button I'm supposed to use here in a second. <laughs> there we go. I found it. Um, <coughs> what you're looking at here is a site outside of the Nagasaki Atomic bomb memorial park. Um, this is actually a one-legged Tory gate, um, which some of you may know. Uh, it's a very iconic artifact for Nagasaki. Um, it was part of a Shinto shrine, and as you can see, only half of the gate is still standing. Um, the blast destroyed the other half, um, and parts of it are still lining the walkway that's below this. Oh, here we are at the entrance to the museum. So the Nagasaki National Peace Memorial Hall um, is to your right, that direction, and the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum is to your left. So, and behind you, as you're looking at this, was sort of a waterfall. And water was a very large part of Nagasaki, and I'll go into that a little bit more later. So this is the signage, which thankfully is also partially in English. We very much appreciated that about Japan. Um, 
This is part of the park. This is the hypo center. And as you can see, there are waves coming out from the hypo center. This picture does not do this justice. It was really very large. Um, and I just, yeah. <laughs> Pictures are always wonderful, but perspective is a little bit more difficult. This is a site that was actually moved to the Hypo Center. Um, this is a portion of a wall from the Urakami Cathedral, which was destroyed in the blast. And this wall was actually reconstructed here on this site. Sorry, let me go back for a second. Uh, there are about 49 memorials and monuments in Nagasaki. They are not all located here at the Hypo Center, of course. Um, there, are, there are schools and hospitals and many other sites that were destroyed, of course. There are seven located here at what they call the Hypo Center area, um, the area where the bomb was actually dropped. Here we are entering the museum itself. Um, this was a fascinating way to enter a museum. And if we had the space, we might consider doing it ourselves. <laughs> You circled the outside of this room, coming down from where you are today in time, all the way down, and you can see that they have dates on the wall as you circle around this huge rotunda. Um, and at the bottom, you hit 1945. And so begins your experience. Your experience in both museums starts at the moment that the bomb was dropped. The time is exceptionally important to the Japanese. Um, as Callie mentioned, it was 8.15 in Hiroshima. It was 11.02 a.m. on August 9th, 1945, when the bomb was dropped. And this is a clock set to that time. Sort of skipping ahead of myself here. Um, in between these two exhibits, the exhibit of the clock and this exhibit of a structure um, that I'll get to, is that they have, you start at the clock, but then you go into a small hallway that has pictures of pre-bomb Japan, well, pre-bomb Nagasaki. And Nagasaki has actually already renovated their museum. Um, so they had, they incorporated things that we know that Hiroshima would also like to incorporate in their upcoming renovations. Um, and one of those things is showing life before the bombing um, and not starting with the devastation because it's about the people it's about the people and the city underneath that mushroom cloud. And that city existed long before um, that bomb was dropped. Nagasaki is an international city. Um, they've, they had open borders since the mid 16th century. Um, Japan is sort of known for having had closed contact with outside countries, um, but Nagasaki was different. And so it had a much larger international contingent. Um, so you go through, you see pre-bombed Nagasaki. And while you're walking through pre-bombed Nagasaki, sort of unconsciously, you're hearing the ticking of a clock. So you've started at a clock. You're seeing pre-bombed Nagasaki and you're just hearing the ticking. And the next thing you see is an aerial of the devastation in Nagasaki. Um, 
And the, so that begins, that's what starts your experience in this particular museum. You enter into a very, this is a very dark exhibit space, um, but large enough for a very large reconstruction, sort of, of an Urakami Cathedral wall. Um, also in this space was sort of like rubble, basically, of large imitations, I imagine. I did not ask if they were real or not. Um, stones on one side, and also in this space was a water tower that had been located at a middle school. And the supports of that water tower were severely bent from the blast. Um, and as well as in this room were many personal artifacts, uh, many of them from parishioners. And there were melted rosaries and just a number of very personal artifacts alongside these large structural issues as well. Um, now we get into the scientific portion. Just like Hiroshima, Nagasaki had a display with an imitation of Batman, as you can see here. The amount of detail in the science was phenomenal. I am not scientifically inclined. I'm very sorry. I've lived here all my life, and I still don't do science. Um, but this explanation was so amazing, um, talking about size and yield and other things that I don't understand and how it works. Um, and it was just so interesting to see so much science in a museum that we know to be about the people. Now, what I, my personal thought on why this happens, just like Judith reiterated earlier, is that it seems like they were trying to give the victims a way to understand what had happened. Up to this point in history, this had not happened, um, I mean, other than three days earlier in Hiroshima. Um, but trying, trying to give the people who come into the museum an understanding, particularly the victims who come into the museum, an understanding of what happened to them, some framework to understand um, th this horrible tragedy. This uh, speaks for itself a little bit. Um, you can see that this is a bottle that has been severely melted. Um, pieces of it have come off. And there's a scientific approach in Nagasaki to, <coughs> just like in Hiroshima, they have a lot of things in common. It's very nice. Um, heat. Sorry, blast and heat and fire and radiation. Um, those are their sort of their talking points. Um, though Nagasaki had some personal effects, I felt like they had more structural or building um, objects in their displays which did not make it any less uh, compelling. So you can see here, uh, they have a significant use of technology. Um, here they have screens. This is the screen on the verification of radiation. Verification was a word that was highly used in Nagasaki. Um, and each of those points, the heat and the blast and the fires and the radiation, had a set of screens just like this. Um, that had photographs and information 
on each of those particular effects. And I also discovered the difficulty of photographing screens it was not a simple task. Um, so I'm sort of skipping ahead here. Ooh, again, Ooh, good thing, because um, <laughs> I'm running out of time. Uh, so you've gone through sort of the scientific explanation, and here we've arrived at the relief efforts in Nagasaki. Um, there were a lot, I'll be honest, um, and they, they are very grateful for the aid that they received, be it American, other foreigners, and the Japanese themselves. Um, many doctors came to the areas affected by the bombs and helped and lent aid. So this particular thing is a report on relief activities after the atomic bombing. I need to get this check. <laughs> I can't read. Um, so on the opposite wall, in this particular space, this is on your left side as you come in, and on your right side would have been the testimonies, um, or as we call them, oral histories here. Uh, first person narratives of experiences <coughs> surviving an atomic bombing. Um, so it was interesting to see those things in the same space, certainly. I'm so excited to talk about this part. Okay. <laughs> I work in the archives. I don't know how many of you know that. Uh, that's my official job. Uh, I'm the registrar, and so I get to see the things that come into our museum. And this was very interesting to me because I was trying to figure out how they managed to display a painted on piece of paper that was 11 meters long and how did they sort of, one, keep displaying different portions of it and also not damage it? So you can see that they kind of have it on rollers here and they would actually scroll to different portions um, over time. They use LED lighting, which is better for preserving your artifacts. This particular piece is called, let me find my sentence, Storm Over Nagasaki. Um, forgive my Japanese here, Kiyo no Arashi. Uh, it's from, it was painted in 1946, and it has the sights of the bombing and the heat rays and the blast. Uh, it was painted by Mr. Noritaka Fukami, um, who actually wound up taking his own life in 1951 uh, due to the significant impact on his life that the atomic bombing had. So this piece also represents something that the Japanese have done, which is not only have they collected oral testimonies from the survivors, they have also had them draw and paint their experience because there is no photographic record, of which makes perfect sense. Um, so the way that they preserve that memory and they teach the next generations is through the art of the people who survived the bombing. It's very, very powerful. Um, and quite frankly, a fantastic idea in lieu of photographs. Oh, here we are. We've arrived in, I looked this up, they call this making the way for the atomic bomb, which I find very interesting. Uh, this is actually sort of a little timeline of the Manhattan Project which this is the, pretty much the one time we saw this anywhere. Um, there are photographs of Groves and Oppenheimer. Um, and I clearly were stand, 
we're standing in front of it, and I think that we're maybe we're still kind of processing what exactly that means. It was an inverted triangle, a very large one, in the same space as the basically nuclear abolition uh, story, which this is a part of. They had several of these, as you can see. This was just the one for New Mexico, so I found that relevant. It has the stories from people who were affected by nuclear development. So it's oral histories with people from various states or countries. Um, and it was, it was very eye-opening um, to see it, to see New Mexico's name uh, in the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum. Okay, I'm gonna speed up now because I've kept you too long already. <laughs> Callie mentioned that both museums have a memorial hall, mm. which is run by the country and not by the state though they are in sort of the same space, will you, if you will. Water was very significant in Nagasaki. I mentioned this earlier. Um, they use it to pay respects to the victims who begged for water after the bombing. Um, and here, <coughs> I'm sure that hearing about Keiko Ogura's story um, about giving somebody water and not knowing that you shouldn't do that after that kind of <clears throat> extreme tragedy. Uh, so this is their, this is the way that they pay respect to those who begged for water. This whole, this whole portion was fascinating. This is their, this is the actual memorial hall so to speak. Um, that thing in the center with the little table in front of it, that holds all the names of the victims of the bombing. Um, it was very tall, and apparently they do take them out on occasion, which I found very impressive. Uh, it also, so it contains volumes and volumes of names, um, including names of foreign victims, American prisoners of war, and blank books for those who are still unnamed. Uh, the columns are and open ceiling are pointing upward. This is, hang on just a second. Two hundred and fifty meters from the hypo center. Um, and they point to the sky because the bomb was detonated above the ground. So this is a place um, where they encourage uh, remembering the souls of the victims. It's a very powerful place. It's a very somber place. Um, it's very quiet. They described the path to getting into this space as a pilgrimage. and. It was just a very, yes, interesting um, experience. We were led through by a couple of staff members who staffed the memorial. And as we went through, uh, we actually passed by a table with two people who were working on testimonies from victims. We don't actually know what the staff told them as we walked by, but they mentioned fairly clearly that we were from Los Alamos. And uh, the, the two people doing the research at the table sort of looked at us and said, Los Alamos, hmm. We, I, think, I think each of us was impacted in a different way by that, but it was very, it was very significant, and it brought to us um, the importance of what we were doing. 
that this conversation does need to happen, that we want to open dialogue with Kyoto and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that it's an important project uh, to develop that dialogue and hopefully eventually that exchange. Aha, found it. <laughs> and so, with that, we are not having a formal Q&A because I took up all your time for that. So please come find us uh, as we <coughs> meander about and enjoy your taste of culture. Let me tell you, it's very exciting. Please try a little bit of everything. <laughs> and a couple of more things. There's um, origami cranes that Evo will. Is he sorry? Okay. Um, that Evo will help us um, if you've never folded one. Please uh, participate. We also have two prototype questions out on the table. We're going to have a reflection space in our new museum, um, and a new reflection space, a, a, a space that we've carved out of former storage space. Um, that will be a place for visitors to reflect on the museum, what they learned about Los Alamos history, um, what they learned about the Manhattan Project in particular. And um, two of those questions are out on the table for you to respond to. So there's large sticky notes, and please participate. We want to know what you think. Thank you very much.